Cool. So, we are honored to have a esteemed OG North Carolina Bitcoin guy with us today. Uh, JP, I believe, we probably met in like 2013 or so. Um, you were probably in high school. I was, you? yeah. Yeah, so, so JP has really been doing this like his whole adult life. Um, and, and really, you've been into mining the whole time, right? Yeah. Um, probably sucking up your parents' electricity and <laughs> yep. farming electricity and whatnot. So um, really, I think JP has kind of followed a similar track as I did, where you know, we really got into Bitcoin as just like a hobby enthusiast type of thing. But we both got so sucked into it that within a few years, we were like, you know, we might as well do this full time and get paid to do what we love. So it's great to hear these kind of stories. And uh, JP, just go ahead and take it away and wow us with your electrical consumption knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, Jameson. Also, first things first, definitely check out Crypto Sisters. They've been great. Their project is amazing, and we're really excited for them. So, future cryptocurrency mining. My name is JP Barrick, and that's what we're talking about today. So how did I get into cryptocurrency? Like Jameson mentioned, I found out about crypto when I was a freshman in high school, and I think it consumed all of my high school career. I don't think I learned anything else but about blockchain and Bitcoin technology. From there, I kept learning about it, kept figuring out what it is, and kind of went down the rabbit hole. So today I'm talking about cryptocurrency mining and what that is. I'm going to start off with like a story of how I started mining, kind of explain the basics of it, people that don't understand it or don't know what it is, and then move to where we're seeing it as we head into the future. So mining is a peer distributed network of individuals contributing computing power to solve complex, complex mathematical equations to create coins, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the other cryptocurrencies. So my first miner was in this party, had three GPUs and started to add more, ran it in my room for a while and eventually we got power in my house in the basement and we were able to, was able to run it down there. During the summer, it was super hot and I was sweating, but I was like, I need to buy my crypto and not making much money right now, but I know it's going to be worth a lot in the future. So I keep my miner running and next thing you know, it ended up paying off. When, we, when I started mining, we didn't really have Ethereum, it wasn't out yet. We started mining with Litecoin, with Dogecoin, and other coins. And it was more of just a way to learn Linux for me and a way to start messing around with computers. My second miner, I don't know how many of you guys know what this is, but it's a Butterfly Labs miner. Butterfly Labs is a very interesting company. They have a history in the Bitcoin space. Basically what happened was is they were around, that one was around $3,000 and I was like, wow, this is an ASIC miner. An ASIC miner is an application specific integrated circuit and it's a miner dedicated just to mining Bitcoins. When I went ahead and got the money to purchase this, I was I thought I was going to make a ton of money because of the current difficulty, these things would be printing almost $100 a day. And for being $3,000, paid off in 30 days. The sad part was, they never really shipped. They did ship, but when it came to my house, there were already brand new miners out, and I wasn't making any money, and didn't even turn it off. Of course, I was calculating it at the current Bitcoin price, which around that time was in the $300 range. I would have kept mining, would have made some money. So, with my individual miners, I wasn't able to mine my own coins because it just wasn't big enough. And that's where pooled mining comes in. So, pooled mining is where a bunch of miners come together and enter a pool, all contributing to one goal. And once you find the block, everyone pays out and gets a percentage of those coins. So, now I'll jump to 2016. I'm out of my basement kind of, I'm st still mining cryptocurrency. And I went ahead and went to my grandma and my uncle and said, hey, I think this is gonna be the future. I think this has potential. They said, okay, awesome, let's buy some graphics cards and try to mine. Honestly, I don't think they really believed in the future of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but they believed in what I was doing and said, sure, we'll help you out. So I went down to Graham, North Carolina, which is about a two hour drive from here. Multiple nights I would drive down there, go to class, drive down there after class, work on the machines all day, and then drive back and go to school in the morning. We started off with these 390 graphics cards and open power supplies. And actually, when we were building the machines, it, we turned them on around 2 a.m. And right when we flipped the switch, we had the voltage meters off, and they started exploding. And we were like, what's happening? This is not supposed to be happening. And the smoke started coming up. But it was great. It was something I'll remember for the rest of my life. As we started to turn on more machines in Graham, 
became a bigger operation, got more GPUs, and started expanding our farm. But the problem was we were running against the clock. As you can see right down here in October 2016, July 2016, April 2016, that's when we were mining. And the difficulty was growing exponentially at the time. The Ethereum was only worth a couple dollars. So back then we were mining hundreds or thousands of Ethereum a day. And we were selling it for three to five dollars to pay off electricity costs. But at the time, we were running against the difficulty chart. We didn't know how high it was going to go or where it was going to stop. But as you can see, back in October 16, it was nothing to where it is now. So with, after kind of understanding mining and building a bunch of miners, we decided, well, who else has graphics cards that we can go ahead and use to do cryptocurrency mining? We focused on gamers. So I created this company called Steampool. And the kind of our motto was mining made easy. We wanted to go ahead and get cryptocurrency mining, make cryptocurrency mining available for everyone that had a GPU or a laptop. People would download it on a computer, they would run it, and they would get paid in PayPal the next week or the next day, depending on how powerful the computer was. This worked pretty well, but we ended up shutting it down because there was a lot of problems and individuals usually have their computers overheat and they start mining with just one graphics card or one CPU. So we ran into a lot of problems. Plus, I went to school, so I had to shut it down. But after that, we started a company called Mining Store. And Mining Store came from the idea that mining is for everyone. That mining is for people that are gamers, for consumers, for small business owners, for institutional investors, for anyone that wants to get into cryptocurrency space, mining is for you. It's a way to get crypto, it's a way to help understand how, understand how to use cryptocurrency, and it's a way to basically enter the ecosystem without having to purchase it with cash, which for some people is the only way they can do it. So after Graham, North Carolina, we hosted our machines there for about a year. And in that year, we learned a lot. Ethereum hit, I think, $20 that year. And now, then it was back down to like $16, $17. We're like, wow, what are we going to do? We're barely making money. We need to go find cheaper power. So we headed up to Washington in Oregon. In Washington, Oregon have the Columbia River Gorge, which has some of the cheapest power in the country. Sadly, once we got up there, we realized that most of the grid was already full, and a lot of the places had already, a lot of the mining operations there had already jumped in and taken all the power that was available and easily accessible. But thankfully, we were able to get a co-location space, and we were able to put all those miners you saw earlier into nice cases and into a co-location space in Oregon. This is kind of where it comes into as we started building mining store and um, we started building a mining store and selling new products. So we had these old GPUs. We're like, what are we going to do with these 390 graphics cards that we bought from, from Graham, North Carolina, all the way to Washington? After we started mining, we were saying we, were saying we need to upgrade our equipment. So we went ahead and started selling. We started selling these graphics cards in bulk to other miners. And we were, then at the moment, I saw that there was potential. There was potential to make money and help people in the industry. Because for me, I taught myself for three to four, three to four years how to build these cryptocurrency miners. I took for granted how much information and knowledge I had regarding cryptocurrency mining. So from there, we went ahead and launched Mining Store, and it's brought us to be able to meet with influencers such as Boss Coin, um, get on the Kaiser Report, and talk about mining there, and kind of put crypto salad at the bottom, and talk about um, how people get into mining and also spread the Bitcoin and blockchain technology to <coughs> everyone. For, for small businesses, mining is like I said, mines and you can enter at any level. For small businesses, it's a great way to earn an additional income stream, and we'll talk more about that in the next few future slides. Institutional mining. This is where most of most of the most of the miners are coming from today, where most of our clients are as, at mining store. They're large institutional miners, either waste energy businesses, um, server farms co-location spaces, and we see them coming into the mining space and deploying thousands and thousands of units. So if you remember the difficulty chart, we started off with 300 GPUs, and that was, wasn't even close to a half a percent or a tenth of a percent of the network. But as Ethereum started to gain in price, more people started deploying miners, and we see huge operations that are either generating power for super cheap or have access to super cheap power and are trying to get into mining. As we move forward in cryptocurrency mining, 
And as we move forward in mining in blockchain technology, we're seeing kind of a consolidation of mining. Mining is now hard for the home user that's paying 12 to 15 cents a kilowatt per hour to make money. But that's where it comes into hosting in one of the in hosting facilities and in these larger institutional mining facilities. That's where most of the capital is going right now, and that's where we think at Mining Store the potential, uh, where the future of mining is going. So I know Ethereum ASICs came up. Who, who here has heard about the Ethereum ASICs before? So Ethereum ASICs were pretty big. They were, came out and they were like, wow, Bitmain's making an ASIC. This was supposed to never happen because um, GPUs are basically have a bunch of RAM on, on the graphics cards to let them do these calculations. Mm -hmm. Bitmain came out and surprised us all a couple months ago and said, bring out Ethereum ASIC. And it was a big discussion in the community. Do we fork Ethereum or do we keep it and keep and just let them do their do their let Bitmain do what it does, which is be Bitmain and be huge. But so the Ethereum ASICs came into the community and they still haven't shipped, they haven't still haven't shipped any yet, but we're starting to get more rumors and I do think they're out there. So I wanted to address any concerns people might have about Ethereum ASICs real quick. Does anyone have any questions about Ethereum ASICs you want to talk about them? Okay, cool. What about Monero ASICs? <laughs> okay, so that's, I'll talk about Monero ASICs for people that don't know. So Monero ended up, they had some, they made built a Monero ASIC, and all these people got them, ordered them, and had them running. And the next thing you know, Monero says, no, 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 no more ASICs, and guess what? eBay gets flooded. Everyone's trying to sell their Monero ASIC to anyone who they can for whatever price they can because it became basically useless overnight. Um, from there, that's... So, explain me, no, 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 no more ASICs. I, I, I've tried to, to wrap my head around, if you're just mining, what, what does it matter to, you know, the, 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 coin, the, the coin people what you're using to mine with? So the reason why it matters to communities in general is because the biggest thing that's the big thing about Bitcoin is decentralization. Right. So we've been they have always had this discussion of um, pools having more than fifty one percent. Back in the day there were pools that were being fifty percent, they say lead this pool, join this one. So the problem with Bitcoin ASICs is with, with the Monero kind of community is the fact that it's now one player who only had the main, was manufacturing the Bitcoin ASICs, which was Bitmain, and they thought it was unfair to all the GPU miners out there, because they, they're the ones who are mining Monero. Once this ASIC comes in, it's a game over. And Bitmain will sell their ASICs for next to nothing profit margins, and will just try to get the difficulty up, because what they do is they develop an ASIC for the current currency, they sell it to consumers, but they already have another version that's way faster. And so when, when they start playing the ASIC game with the coin, Bitmain is then getting a majority of that revenue, a majority of the hashing power, so it's not decentralized anymore. <coughs> Compared to with graphics cards, it allows you to decentralize the mining process and allows consumers, small businesses, and different institutional side, institutional investors to be still in the game and still participate in the mining game. That's a good question. This is Silicon Valley. I don't know if anyone has seen the show, but I just wanted to drop it here. This is a Bitcoin rate. <laughs> it's, yeah. The most recent episode had this loud thing. Whenever the Bitcoin price drop was like, Whoo! But anyway. It was the shortest heavy metal song in history. <laughs> shortest? <laughs> so how can you guys get involved today with mining store and just mining in general? How many of you guys are mining at home? One, two, three, four. How many of you guys have thought about mining at home? What's preventing the people with their hands up now from mining? Money. Money? Anything else? Rising difficulty. Rising difficulty? Hold on, I can't sell. Hold on, I can't sell. Can't power. Heat and noise. <laughs> Heat and noise. So these are all huge concerns. And at Mining Store, we see customers every day that have these problems or, you know, are trying to find a need, trying to find a solution for the heat and noise or to get it too high of a price. But at Mining Store, we're here to help you guys. So if any of you guys have any questions about getting into mining, we'll talk to you guys at the back of that table and they'll help you out. If you have any friends that want to get into mining, they can help you out. And then this is actually the last slide I have for cryptocurrency mining on here. But I want to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about, the future of mining. So if anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and answer them. So we've got a couple. We'll start with you. We talked about earlier um, the cost of uh, mining power. Mm -hmm. How about the uh, network? 
So for Bitcoin mining and cryptocurrency mining in general, you don't actually need that vast of a network. You just need it to be um, basically consistent and you can be able to count on it. Because if it goes down and crashes, then the miners will actually start crashing and they need to reboot it. But regarding network, it doesn't take much. Yeah. It's probably... You'd probably be fine with just a few megabits yeah. per second. Right? The goal is for mine to be available by anyone, so it's not much data. Yep. Um, a lot of like, projects, including Ethereum, are uh, moving from proof of work to proof of stake or master nodes or etc. What What do you think about like next six months, next year sure. or two? So because we want to invest like the money, like at least last for a year or two. So when it comes to proof of work and proof of stake, that's been a, a consideration actually since when I got into Ethereum mining back in 2016, the discussion was starting of how are we going to move to POS? Because it's it's uses less energy at the end of the day and it's a better it's people think it's a better consensus um, no, a consensus mode or way to way do consensus. So the way to answer that question is POW I think will always be here simply because mining now has grown to such a large size that we have industry giants that are putting so much capital into mining that they will continue to promote cryptocurrencies and continue to make different coins that are only POW, that are, can be used by the machines. For Bitmain, they have an incentive to have cryptocurrency mine, to be able to have coins that are able to be mined by cryptocurrency miners. And there's now large capital getting in there. They're not going to let these thousands and thousands of graphics cards and basic miners go to waste if, there was someone, if it all changed to POS or another algorithm. So the future of mining, like I said, is continuing. It's it's going to be institutional. I believe the future mining will be large institutional investors getting into mining, kind of like real estate. So right now we have. We all think everyone here investing thinks blockchain is going to be the future, and with mining, we're seeing that as as it continues to. As it continues to, as the network continues to grow and the price continues to rise, more and more money is being poured into cryptocurrency mining. And we're seeing that it's an arms race now. It's an arms race of who can put the most machines in their data center to go ahead and collect the most Bitcoin and to basically hold that for when crypto is going to, uh, when crypto is like going to be mass adopted. And as Bitcoin becomes, becomes uh, as Bitcoin keeps having, and there's Less, it becomes less mined or it becomes less of it out there. Mining is the only way to get it. And so I think what we're going to see is just millions and billions of dollars going into mining simply because that's the only way you can get crypto. And as the price is rising, it's going to be able to pay for that electricity cost and those that increased cost of um, additional miners. So from a cost production perspective, uh, it's all about how there have been some interesting articles about uh, the cryptocurrency miners collecting power consumptions and feeding the local citizenry. Uh, they're brown out in upstate New York and have a lot of the grid is basically stood in the floor. There are lots of places where there's a megawatt or two to put around. But how do you see the really achievement of scale and whether it's scale in the name of the breeding of the co-location facility or so for your first question, what we're seeing is that cryptocurrency mining gets a lot of bad press. That is very true. But in reality, the, the power companies that we've talked to actually love cryptocurrency mining simply because we provide a simple easy power load for them, so it's a constant draw. We don't have peak off hours, we don't have um, spikes in power usage. So what I see cryptocurrency mining going is to an integrated into the current grid system to provide stability. Um, we see that in a lot of the power companies we're working with and a lot of the waste energy companies. They're providing stability to the grid by putting in thousands of miners and then they're able to, s they're able to see that constant power draw from the utilities perspective. And that's where I think, when I said, the question, the future mining is going. When it comes to outside of the US, we're actually seeing a lot of country companies come to the US for mining because of our judicial protection and legal protection here. Because out in Mongolia and China, they used when they used to build cryptocurrency mines there, 
they would basically go to the local leaders and say, hey, we want to do this cryptocurrency mining thing. You guys have a power station. Let's run a line from there to our warehouse, and we'll both make money and pay each other, and that'll be fine. But now the government is going to crack it down in Mongolia, and in China, and um, in Hong Kong. And right now, all these miners are starting to leave the US. So some of our larger clients are working on getting those miners from those areas into the United States from the legal protection. The two questions. <clears throat> the first one, uh, you see the power companies going for a load balancing solution so that when the, when the peak, when peak power demands come, come in the afternoon in the summertime or, or whenever in the wintertime, and whenever the wintertime, certainly summer here, um, that, that in order to get uh, you know a, a good de a good deal with the power company, you'll you'll have a, a lower po you'll have a lower power during the peak. Um, so do you see the power companies doing that? So that or do you see the miners accepting that as a as a trade off for the cheap power? So what a lot of miners are doing when that peak happens, will actually go ahead and out of, depending on the power company you're working with. They have the peak hours, and you actually have to put, put a generator in, so you're not on the basis, you're not on the infrastructure, or you just shut off your mine. For I think for some of the power companies, it's 200 hours a year. You have to shut off your mine, and it's cheaper for paper miners just to shut it off and then turn everything back on um, a couple hours every month to go ahead and reduce that in those hot summer times. And uh, are you, or is anybody uh, using immersion technology? For uh, cooling, or is it all still air? So the debate between immersion and air, um, I've seen some people that have claimed to have really good immersion rates that I've heard on phone calls, but I've never actually seen one in person that works well. The problem is, is just the cost. It's much cheaper to move just the air, as we see in all these facilities in Iceland and anywhere where it's a cold environment, just to move the air than compared to immersion technology. Some of the hotter places we are seeing people use immersion because it is um, Thermally more efficient. Yeah, exactly. And higher high density. Right. And it, it's higher, well, higher density, but in crypto mining, the biggest thing is cost. Most of the facilities aren't in tier one data centers. They're in what we like to call as chicken coops, or basically, you know, these buildings that are just built just for cryptocurrency mining, and a ton of, ton of air gets sucked through and out the other side, and that's all. Uh, what's, do you have any tools or Methodologies to go about measuring the ROI or potential ROI for mining strategy? Sure. So, ROI for mining is one of the hardest things to calculate simply because you have, you have the price and you have the difficulty. So, neither of those, you have no idea where they're going to be. So, when it comes to doing mining, you wouldn't get an exact moment at this time how much money I'm going to make. But what I suggest is, I would ask, do you believe in crypto? Yep. So, if you believe in crypto, then mining is a way to get cryptocurrency. You should just Get, get a miner, mine, and then hold that. Because it's, and that's the big discussion, is do you buy cryptocurrency right now, or do you buy a miner and then mine cryptocurrency and see what you get? And it's a way to, a lot of people that are kind of on the boat about cryptocurrency or like on the edge and don't necessarily, don't believe in it completely, mine is a good way for them to start, because now they have a physical device, they can go ahead and see, okay, this is where this virtual money is coming from, and if something goes bad, I can sell these graphics cards to gamers and to other people that'll purchase them. So it's a way to hedge your investment too. And one small follow-up on that. With, with the longevity of your particular equipment, if you, if you notice that the GPUs or the ASICs or whatever have a longer lifespan than others, and when you when you call it quits on this is not profitable? Anymore. Sure. So for ASIC mining, um, when we started off with Butterfly Labs, like I mentioned, the early Butterfly Labs miner I had, that was, I believe, like a five giga hash miner, which at the time was something that was, gonna, was great because people were using GPUs. But now ant miners are 13 plus 14 tera hashes, so they're way higher. Um, it's because the chips process basically sped up and they designed, they, got, they caught up to seven nanometers, which is where AMD and all, the, all those guys are. So that, does, that process has basically stopped in the innovation. Now they're still doing innovation, but we haven't seen any leaps like we were back in uh, 2014, or not, 2015, 2016. With the when it comes to GPU mining, those machines are you're able to use them for years. I still have GPUs that I bought six years ago that I'm still mining with today, simply because that technology hasn't changed and is advancing. It's advancing, but it's advancing very slow. For GPUs, 
Um, so we saw whenever cryptocurrency spikes, we see the GPU price climbing with that. Um, because more people can, more people getting in the industry, more people are hearing about it, they're hearing about mining and they're going out and buying graphics cards. Right now, GPU prices are kind of are much lower than they were two months ago. Um, but my guess is when Bitcoin and Ethereum start to come up again, we'll see the same thing happen. Simply because the supply chains of where the GPUs are being made, um, they can't make the chips fast enough, and then you have you have the prices being raised by the distributors and prices being raised by the manufacturers because they understand that cryptocurrency miners Unlike gamers, who don't care about the price of the graphics card because they're putting, they're doing, the, they're running different numbers than a gamer. So they're basically putting as much cash as they can at the problem, and then they're getting as many graphics cards as they can. So graphics cards for Ethereum miners are up. The 570s are up to $500, $600 per. Now they're much cheaper. So you see the idea that you kind of trying to specialize in So they have made cryptocurrency mining um, GPUs specifically. The problem with those is, from a miner standpoint, they don't come with the warranty that a mobile GPU miner comes with. When you buy a gaming mine, a gaming graphics card, you get a three-year, two-year warranty, and those warranties are big when you're running your machine 24/7. With these cryptocurrency miners that are, or with these GPUs that are just made for cryptocurrency mining, they usually have no display ports on them. Um, sometimes no fans, depending on the type of model you buy. So for different type of, for people with um, more risk, they can buy that, but then it's going to have no resale value, so it's basically an ASIC. Um, but if you're buying equipment that has resale value that can be used to sell to gamers, then um, it kind of takes away that risk. I have a question about, if you're kind of small scale, you know, you have like one with six or seven GPUs in your house. So I, like I have one, and I have it inside the house, and in the summer it's a barrel. Mm -hmm. so I was actually going to sell it this year, maybe. But now like a garage, it gets about the hottest will ever get to sign. Is it safe to put it in that? Is it have a fan pointed at it? So it's open, it's not the case. Yeah, so what I would say for that is when you have one miner and you're running it, even any miner, the biggest thing is how fast can you move the air away from the car. So as long as you have air circulation and you can move that air, we suggest seven to nine times a minute away from that car, then you can go ahead and keep it cool and running it at 90 Fahrenheit is perfectly fine. Because it can get up to 90 Celsius in the car, which is like some of us, 180, 190 Fahrenheit. So as long as you're moving that air away from that car, the temperature should be fine. It should be stable. How do you figure out if you're doing it? Just fans, cases are really great for that because you're able to put fans and blow the air directly on the cards and then move that air away from those cards. So um, depending on where that fan placement and the speed of those fans um, is how you really move that air from, from the back of the car. Now this is... And condition here to make sure that you're, you're not putting, putting particulate matter through your moving air, if it's not filtered in your garage, you're going to wind up compounding your problem, your heat buildup problem. If you have one of those, just move the air case Yeah. Okay. Filter, 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 filter. Filter, yeah. filter the air is a big one when you're just using air cool systems. Right. Uh, in terms of escapability, uh, let's say I have 510 GP in my house. If I want to scale to 500, what are the challenges? Have you done that? So when you're yeah, so when you're going from five to ten GPUs, you're scaling to five hundred. The biggest challenge is you're going to be your power and your availability of power because in your residential you won't be able to get that type of power. In a business, um, depending on location, you can get that type of power if you uh, run out of business, uh, just office space. But then you run into cooling, like I mentioned, in the air filtration. So you have to filter the air, cool it, and filter the air, and then pour it through the system. Um, we've, you've, People run into a lot of problems with air moving the air and designing their kind of like the room incorrectly. Um, a lot of open air rigs we've seen have had issues, and in our experience, we better to use cases because you're able to apply that air directly on the cars and move, move that air past the units. Um, those are the two biggest things: power and, and uh, power and the air. So in terms of like in like business side, uh, is it like something normal or even legal to? have and register company just for mining? Yeah, so there's, it's perfectly legal to be cryptocurrency mining in the United States. You can have a registered, um, registered company and do it. The biggest thing is make sure you tell your energy provider that what you're doing is cryptocurrency mining and not growing pot. Not growing pot because it gets And I grow lights. Exactly, so make sure they know that you're doing cryptocurrency mining and um, yeah, that's, that's basically it when it comes to the legality.
Are there any like shared facilities that you can put? Like so, if you are if you are looking to expand a mining operation, um, we there are plenty of co-location spaces. We do have one where you bring your miners to us, we put them in cases, we run them, we get a cheaper rate for power than you do um, at your house, and we basically pass it on to you. You pay us a monthly monthly cost to host the units for you. I can manage it. And wait, man, you can still manage it. Come see it um, and access the VPN and stuff. And, yeah. So I can mine what I want to mine? You, you mine what you, you control exactly what you want to mine and everything. They're your miners, they're just using our power. Nice. Yes, yeah, so I saw somewhere in Brooklyn this guy who got an S7, right? He got a note from FTC. Like, I think that was like a crazy thing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't know why that happened. Yeah, so he, he got a note from FCC because it was like disrupting the horizon without power. So the horizon went to FCC and said, and none of the big main miners are FCC required because they're all so, how do you protect you everything in a pattern cage? Well, that's the only, this, what he's talking about is that there was a guy in New York City who was running his Bitcoin miner and it was um, not compliant with SEC. Like, oh, yeah, and so what happened was, it was just, it was like, what am I doing? Like, you just got to notice. I've only heard one story that was that one of that happening. It was very out of the blue. Yeah. So I, I don't really know much, but usually you don't have to keep, you don't have to keep your Bitcoin miner in a pair of cage or anything. That's a over here. So two questions. One, with your company, what percentage of your revenue right now, approximately, is in actual hardware and selling it, and then everything else? So all of mining stores, percentage of all its revenue is are selling hardware. We have another company that hosts hardware. Um, that is a small percentage compared to the actual hardware sales. Because a lot of our sales come, we do a lot of GPUs. We help people source graphics cards, ASIC miners, um, and our own programs. Because I had a conversation with, with a professor a year ago, and he, he, he said that crypto mining is going to be like the gold rush in California 150 years ago. And the, the person who got wealthiest from gold mines was Levi Strauss. And so I'm thinking that that's what you've already decided, that, that, that you're going to make money selling goods we might too, so. to the miners. We, we, there is there is something there when it comes to the Bitmain does the same thing. You know, you do you sell the miners and your mining at the same time. Um, for us, we're providing more of like a service. The goal is to help you guys, help people get into cryptocurrency mining, help people understand it, help people get over those technical issues when it comes to mining. Yeah, but by offering the, the cooperative mining farm, Correct. you are also then selling them the product. In, in, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, so the goal is likelihood that you're selling them the, uh, the mining equipment. Yeah. So you're benefiting. So, and you I'm benefit not, nothing from well, nothing wrong with that. It sounds like a very entrepreneurial yeah. um, you know, <laughs> uh, way of doing business. But again, looking at the number of people who haven't made money with mining and the expense and the depreciation of a lot of the equipment, um, you know, to me, there's still a measure you, in your conversation to the, tonight, you kind of made, made it sound like it's an automatic slam dunk. And I don't know that it is, and, and I, I'd uh, like to hear a little bit yeah, of that. Yeah, so I've been mining, and I've, we, I've talked to people and helped them out and built their, own, built their mines when I started off in like 2014, 2015, 2016. I've never met someone that lost money cryptocurrency mining personally. Because everyone I've met that had mine, bought cryptocurrency miner from us, I helped build a rig, ended up holding that crypto, and it's now worth a lot. Of course, you know, we don't know where cryptocurrency is going, and that's the thing with mining. Sometimes it's not profitable. Sometimes you're barely making any money and you're just sucking up the power bill. But those cryptocurrencies that you're that little bit you might make that five or ten percent every month, when you're holding that part of that portfolio and you're managing it properly, I'll, people are I'm seeing people make make money. You mentioned because crypto's going up, right? But at the end of the day, mining is a way for people to get that cryptocurrency and instead of just buying the cash. And they're, they're holding that cryptocurrency, and then it's worth more in the future. It's certainly possible to lose money while yeah. mining. I mean, the the economics of mining dictates that there's this equilibrium where most people are operating on the brink of profitability. Some people are getting pushed out of profitability, might be turning off their miners. The price might go down so much, a lot of, a lot of people turn them off. But then the the opposite also happens. You know, we had a, a miner uh, talk last year, and he was like, "This is you know." When, when the 
prices were basically going vertical and hockey sticking, and, and he was saying, I'm pulling all of my old miners out of the warehouse and plugging them back in right now because they're becoming profitable again. So it's a very you know, swing type of business, just like most of these things in crypto are. But I think really what, what JP is saying is this is, mining is like another way to do long-term speculation on these assets, just another way to get into doing it. Correct, yeah. What are your thoughts, and I don't know, maybe you do this, are you mining great rentals from ISAS or a couple other companies instead of having your mining? I haven't done that yet, but I've considered it. So for mining great rentals and cloud mining, the problem with that is you don't actually physically own the hardware. And that's a big thing about mining, is physically owning that hardware helps you um, mitigate some of that risk. So with NiceHash, it's great, you, you can buy some, you can buy a percentage of miners, which is good if you're gonna speculate on a cryptocurrency's future, instead of buying like, um, instead of buying that coin, you go ahead and buy miners to mine it. But if you're just trying to mine it and then make the money for mining, keep playing that cycle, I don't think you actually can win in that game, simply because you're paying more than you're actually gonna make when it comes to the future, if you sell back from Bitcoin. Unless, of course, the price goes up that other way. I was thinking more for spec mining. So for speculative mining, it's a great way to definitely quickly scale an operation. If you think a coin's gonna be huge, you put a couple thousand dollars in the mining, and you went out miners, now you have all that coin. It's a way to accumulate, like I said in the beginning, it's a way to accumulate cryptocurrency. You got, you got a question? So I'll go ahead. Um, you talked a little bit about the browsing of mining. So obviously, if you go out and buy So when it comes to mining and privacy, that's a reason why a lot of my customers back in the day started, they wanted to get into mining because they wanted to, they didn't want to do the K, K, KYC, AML compliance that Coinbase and all those people have to do. So when it bought cryptocurrency miners, when you buy cryptocurrency miner and you're mining cryptocurrency, no one knows who, who, which miner is behind that address. They just see the string and it cuts the deposit in your account and now it's your coins. They're called fresh coins and there's been a talk about, you know, if a coin's tainted, if it's been used for illegal purchases, will it still be considered illegal if you get that possession of that coin? So mining is a way to know that you have fresh coins. And for some, um, for some banks and larger financial institutions, getting fresh coins from miners is something that uh, miners are actually able to sell their coins for a premium to these institutions for because they understand exactly where they came from and now they can store them in their, their vaults. So do you have any advice or resources in terms of paying your taxes for crypto mining profits? Because it's a little different than the capital gains. So for cryptocurrency mining profits, I talked to an accountant first, but I'm fairly sure you're supposed to report um, your earnings when you sell your cryptocurrency. And then I don't exactly know how, you know, it's no, when you mine it's the fair amount. Yeah. When you mine it, so they get it a fair amount. So yeah, I, yeah, just like that. Yeah. Let the I let the accounts handle what you get out. So, anyone else any questions? One more. Be, beware, beware the fifth rivet. Beware what? The fifth rivet. Did you buy Strauss? Yeah. <laughs> beware of the fifth rivet. This is the the flaw it has it, the flaw it has designed. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the one thing that uh, I'm coming from, you know, I'm participating in the community of data, of data analysts, okay. and there there is a, a dearth of uh, GPUs because they they're being uh, bought out bought up by uh, they, the uh, crypto miners. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there is a secondary, there's now a secondary market for somebody who wants to get out of mining and for, old, for your older equipment. So you may look, you may look at the uh, data analyst uh, market and say, oh, here's, here's some hardware you've been looking for and you know, they're, they're handy downs as long as it's not the, the cheap, strictly, mine, strictly mining hardware that, that would give you and your customers uh, an easier out or a way to turn over to do your upgrades if you know that there's a secondary market. The question that I was going to ask was uh, about leading edge or bleeding edge uh, as, as a new coin might come out uh, and the algorithm that's being used, the algorithm that's being used, is there any advantage 
to being on the leading edge of having something like an A6 or, or uh, uh, you know, a leg up on processing to do the mining for a particular, for a particular new point. Um, well, I mean, you're just going to become more efficient. So usually when a newer system comes out, it uses less power. And, um, no, when a new coin comes out. Not, so when, not, a new, when a new coin comes out, they usually use, they have, I think there's like 20 different mining algorithms, but when a new coin comes out, they usually just use one of those um, because they all kind of follow the same premise. If a new mining algorithm does come out, though, um, they have all the GPUs, it's usually on the, the DRAM is what it's, the DDR5 RAM, and then from there, it's you just, depending on how expensive your car is. So when Monero came out with their own thing, um, they were, the, the 570 graphics cards were okay at it, but the, the Vegas, the brand new Vegas were really good at it because they had um, the shaders to process the algorithm faster. I was, so I was thinking, I was thinking if you, if you had FPGAs, you could, you could more quickly come up with a customized uh, accelerated, accelerated hardware for a particular new algorithm and get a leg up because you're, you're on that leading edge. Well, we're seeing most, most FPGAs can actually put their cards in mind. Like most of these algorithms are made specifically just for GPUs because that's they want to keep that decentralization. So most, any new algorithm comes out is usually just for GPUs. It takes a while for the FPGAs to catch on, and some of the only, I think only a couple algorithms that they build FPGAs for. Any other questions? Could you comment on the specific how many coin Kodak one, and then also comment of possibly moving the bond market, the bond market, the bond market, the bond market, the blockchain to settle down? Well, those are both not necessarily related to mining, but, you know, in well, the blockchain space, Kodak Coin was is an Ethereum ERC-20 token, so that's, you know, on the on the Ethereum network, and what was the second question? About moving the whole bond, the bond market, all that trillion dollars here to the blockchain for the settlement. I mean, that's, those are both ERC20s, so they're not necessarily mining with Ethereum. Um, they build IC, there's like ICOs and tokens you can build on top of that blockchain. Um, those coins aren't mineable, so if you hear about an ICO token coming out, you can't actually mine and get that cryptocurrency. So you only can get um, specific cryptocurrencies through mining. Thanks again, guys, for letting me talk to you. Like I said, it's been great. Appreciate it. If you have any other questions, feel free to come up and talk to me after this, and I'll be happy to answer them for you.